Hello my dear students. So I'm going to continue the lesson. Today we will be discussing dispersal of fruits and seeds. Now in the previous chapter we discussed how pollination takes place. Before that we looked at the structure of flowers, then the process of pollination. We discussed the different agents of pollination and how flowers show different adaptations for their agent of pollination. And thereafter, we discuss the process of fertilization and how the ovary becomes the fruit and the fertilized ovules become the seeds. So thereafter, I asked you all a question to think about what will happen if all the fruits and seeds that were produced on one mother plant falls under the same plant and starts to grow? What will happen? I'm sure you all know the answer. There will be lot of competition. Then it's difficult for them to survive. So only a few seeds might grow into a new plant and they will survive. And also they will have no chances of finding a new habitat. So to avoid these types of issues and to grow and germinate efficiently and successfully so that their life will continue these fruits and seeds need to be dispersed. So, under dispersal of fruits and seeds, we will see why they need to be dispersed. Spreading away of the fruits and seeds from the mother plant is referred to as dispersal of fruits and seeds. So, this is important. Spreading away of the fruits and seeds from the mother plant so that they get a new habitat. Plants fulfill their following requirements by that process. So that is to fulfill these requirements. The first one, competition. Now I told you all if they all grow under the same plant, obviously the space will be limited. There will be limitation or competition for water, nutrients, even sunlight. So because of that, they may not be able to acquire all the required requirements. So competition for essential requirements is minimized. So the more they go away from the mother plant, the competition will be reduced. Competition for what? You can say water, minerals, space, etc. So these are some factors. Those are all essential for their growth. Then they can find new habitats. Now say if you have a mango tree in your home garden, if all the seeds start to grow there, you will have too much of mango trees. Maybe you won't want it. So that means they don't have a habitat. But if they get dispersed to another place, they will find a new habitat where they can grow successfully. So to find new habitats. Then diversity is increased. How is diversity increased? Now, as I said again, if it's your home garden, if all the mango trees grow in your home garden, it's only going to be one type of tree or few type of trees. But when they go to a different place where there is no mango tree, a different habitat, new habitat, then the diversity of that habitat increases. The same way when the fruits or seeds of some other plant come and fall in your garden and they start growing there, the diversity in your home garden also increases. So that is how it happens in the natural environment as well. Diversity is increased. So competition for essential requirements is minimized, new habitats are found, diversity is increased and protection from pests and agents of diseases. So in a certain place, if there is pest and agents of diseases, and if these seeds get dispersed away from the mother plant and they start to grow there, they are safe from the pest and agents of diseases. So to satisfy all these four purposes, they need to get dispersed. So what is seed and fruit dispersal? Spreading away of the fruits and seeds away from the mother plant. That is what we call as dispersal of fruits and seeds. So for this to happen also, we need a medium or agents that help in the dispersal of fruits and seeds. So with that introduction, I will move on to the next slide. 
methods of dispersal of fruits and seeds. So, here also we have different methods. There are four principal methods of dispersal of fruits and seeds as mentioned below. So, there are four methods. What are the four methods? First one, by animals. Then the second one, by wind. Then we have another one, by water. And the fourth one is, by explosive mechanism. So, fruits and seeds will be dispersed by animals, by wind, by water and also there is another method by explosive mechanism. We will discuss all these four methods one by one. So, before we do that, there is an assignment for you all. Identify and name the agent of dispersal of fruits that you can come across. Identify and name the agent of dispersal of fruits that you come across. Mention two adaptations that each fruit has for its method of dispersal. So, something that you might have seen or that you can think of. Now, as I said, in your home garden, most probably you will have a mango tree or at least you would have seen a mango tree. You know a mango fruit that is very fleshy. Normally, we use that as a fruit because the fruit is edible. Inside the fruit, you get the seed. So, what do you think? Now, we consume it as a fruit. Even the birds, other animals, they also consume it as a food. They can eat the edible fleshy part. But inside that, what is there? The seed of mango. Is that edible? No. Why? Because it has a hard outer covering or the seed coat is very, very hard. So that the animals, even man, we can't consume the seed. So what happens? If an animal, say let's say a monkey, goes to a mango tree, it takes the mango fruit, eats the flesh, but while eating, it will move from the mother plant to a different place. Once it finishes eating the flesh, what happens? The seed is not edible. So, it just drops it there, then and there. Then the mango tree can start growing in that habitat. So, there the seed is being dispersed. What are the adaptations? The mango fruit has a edible flesh. And it has a fragrance. You all know the fragrance of mango. And it has a taste. So, tasty, edible, fleshy part of the fruit is there. So, that is for the dispersal of seed. But the seed coat is hard so that it cannot be easily broken. Inside that only the embryo will be there. That will be able to grow into the plant. So, those are adaptations shown by a mango fruit. So, here you are supposed to write that down. I will just show you all a few examples so that you can think of many other examples and write them down. So, identify and name the agent of dispersal of fruits that you come across. So, first one as I told you, mango. So, we said there are four agents or four methods out of that you all know this is by animals. And what are the adaptations? First one, fleshy, edible part of fruit. And also you all know it has a color and a nice fragrance. Fruit that is colorful. And has a fragrance to attract animals. So, those are adaptations. Although they have said two, I have actually included many adaptations here. Then I said 
the seed is not edible because of the hard seed cover. So that can survive. Those are two main adaptations. In addition to that, you can think of many other adaptations as well. Then we need to write two adaptations for each fruit. Another fruit that again something that you might have at your households or your home garden, a coconut. How does this coconut get dispersed? Now if it falls down, can it move on its own? No. Can the animals carry it? Is there an edible part like in mango? Can we eat, can the animals eat the fleshy part of the coconut? No. So there is no edible part. So in that sense, it will not attract any of the animals. And you all know the next mode of dispersal, wind. Can it fly with the wind? Can it be taken with the wind? No. There it's too heavy for the dispersal by wind. So then there are two more methods by water and by explosion. You have never seen the coconut, the fruit getting exploded or the coconut coming out. That never happens. So obviously it has to be by water. You might have seen that also. The coconut fruit floating in water. So there the dispersal is by water. So the next one, coconut, it is by water. So what are the adaptations? Now there is the skin, outer skin, usually it's green in color, but when it dries, it becomes brown in color. Inside the skin, you know the coconut husk is there, the fiber-like substance. And inside that only, we have the shell of the coconut. And inside the shell, there is the endocarp that we use for cooking as well. So inside that only, the seed and the embryo will be there that will grow into a plant. So there is a hard shell. So that shell actually prevents the water from entering into coconut. When it is floating in water, if water goes into coconut, you all know even at home if you have the coconut for a few days, if there's water inside or if it's soaked in water, it will get spoiled. Same thing will happen to the seed that is going to be dispersed. So this shell prevents the water from entering into the seed. So that is one adaptation. Then you all know about the outer skin and the husk. Now this husk is a fibrous structure. In between, there are spaces in which there is air. So that makes the coconut to become light enough to float on water. So that is again another adaptation to float in water or get dispersed by water. So we can write those. So here I can say coconut husk. Husk is a fibrous structure fibrous structure with air filling the spaces spaces this makes the fruit light enough to float in water. That is one adaptation. Then the next one, the hard shell does not allow water to enter into the sea. So those are adaptations. One we saw mango by animals. 
then coconut by water then can you think of something that gets dispersed by wind dispersed by wind there are so many trees around you all or you all know about trees that are in the forest or in your environment for example cotton so these cotton seeds are very very light they are very tiny and they are made in a high amount or very many number of seeds are produced at a time inside one fruit and you all know when this cotton burst open when it is matured when it's time for the seeds to get dispersed it, the cotton actually burst open and the seeds since they are very light they can just flow with the wind so they are they are being dispersed by wind so that is another example so the third one i will take it as cotton cotton by wind here what are the adaptations as i told you very light seeds very light seeds seeds and also they are produced in large number produced in in large number similar to this even morunga drumsticks that is also dispersed by wind you would have seen that now even though you may not have seen it being dispersed by wind you would have seen the morunga the vegetable that we use for cooking drumstick at homes so when you cut open the drumstick you would have seen the seeds now in those seeds you would have seen no, the seed is in the middle but like around it there is like a membrane or feather like structure so that actually helps the seed to flow with wind the same way you would have seen these the milkweed like hair like structures that also helps to disperse by wind so these are all different adaptation shown by fruits or seeds to be dispersed by wind similar thing is seen in plants that are dispersed by explosive mechanism now for example balsam plant what we call as kudalu or kasi thumbai now that also has seeds you all would have seen that at home sometimes you will have this plant very colorful flowers and the seeds are produced now here if the seed is something like this when it is mature enough dry enough you would have seen the seed exploding when the outer skin opens out there are very very tiny dark brown or black color seeds inside they will just get spread out so they are also the seeds are very light very small and they are produced in large number so they also explode and because of the explosion they get pushed away so these are all different adaptations now like these students you would have seen so many plants so many fruits so many seeds and you would have observed them you can think of many more adaptations so you can list out lot of seeds and you can identify the method by which the seed or the fruit is being dispersed is that clear to you all now i am sure you can think of many of the seeds and fruits so with that introduction now we will move on to the next slide where we will be discussing the methods of seed and fruit dispersal one by one dispersal of fruits and seeds by animals that's the first method so under that we will be discussing the different adaptation shown by these fruits and seeds the first one there are succulent edible parts succulent edible parts succulent means the fleshy uh, the taste it's juicy so that is succulent edible parts edible means you can consume it so it's either us or the animal so succulent edible parts are there examples one example we already discussed 
mango, then there is pepper. Those are different fruits. So here you can see the color, a bright yellow color or orange color that actually attracts animals. Then you get the fragrance that also attracts the animals. So they come and eat the fruit because it's the succulent edible part. They can consume the fruit and they throw away the seeds. So inside the mango, there's only one large seed that develops into the tree. Whereas if you take papaya or pepper, here also you can see this part is the succulent edible part. But inside there are so many seeds. Here of course when you compare these two, this has lot of seeds, very much smaller in size. So they also get spread around and they all start growing or germinating into a new plant. So although these are both with succulent edible parts, the way the seeds are is different. So you can see so much of adaptation and differences between all these fruits and seeds. Then there is the second one. There are attractive colors. I mentioned that in the previous one also. There are attractive colors, even mangoes you get in different colors, yellow, orange, similar to that. If you look at these fruits. Now the second example, there are attractive colors. So false fruit of cashew. So if you take the cashew, this nut is the real fruit. Actually it is the seed, but this part is the false fruit. So false fruit, why do we call it false fruit? Normally the ovary becomes the fruit. You all can remember the wall of ovary becomes the pericarp and inside the fertilized ovule becomes the seed. So here the nut is the fertilized ovule so that is the seed but the fruit is not formed from the ovary. That is why we call it a false fruit or pseudo fruit. Fruits are false fruit of cashew nut. You can see the color very attractive. Reddish, orangish, yellow, uh, between green and yellow like that varying colors that attract animals. And also that is edible as well. So the animals consume it and disperse the seed. Same thing goes for banana. Banana again you all know the different colors. Yellow, sometimes it becomes reddish. There are some reddish color banana, then certain banana which have green color skin. So either way they can attract animals. So two different adaptations. Not only knowing the example students, just look at the fruit and try to get more information regarding their adaptations. So with that I will move on to the next slide. Then there are adaptations where these fruits or seeds you can see the third one, there are hooks or hairs to assist to be attached. There are hooks or hairs assist to be attached to the animal. So they need to get attached to the body of the animal. So if it is an animal to the body of the animal, if it is us, maybe to our legs or the shoes or even our dress. So that's how they attach. To do that, they can either have hooks or hairs. Now look at the first one. Now here you can see the structure. What is that? Nagadarana or Maramundirikai. That has hooks. So the claw-like structures that can get stuck to the dress or the body of the organism. Then we have a pala or Amanaku that also has adaptations having hooks or hair-like structures in order to get attached to the body of the organism, animal. Then we have the love grass or tottiri. You can see here, now these parts, very tiny seeds that are somewhat sticky. Even you might have experience when you walk in grasslands, these tiny seeds, they get stuck to your legs or your dress. So same way they can stick to the body of the organism. So that is Tuttiri love grass. Then here again you have this plant. Here you can see these tiny fruits. They also have hair like structures on the outer surface. They can get stuck to the body. They can uh, get attached to the body of the animal so that they get dispersed. So what happens when the animal is moving along this near these trees or this grass or any of the plant. These 
seeds or fruits they attach to the body of the animal and when they move around they go to another place and they are again when they uh, move along uh, uh, let's say a structure or another tree because of friction these seeds come off their body so they are they fall in a new habitat and start germinating so that is how they get dispersed then we have the next one that is the next adaptation there are shapes and patterns to treat animals so these seeds for example, Olinda or Kundrumani, they have this red color body and the black color part in front and they resemble a ladybug. So because of that, animals mistake them as a ladybug and they try to consume it as their food. But once they realize it is not their prey, what they do is they just drop it somewhere else. So here also they consume it at one place, they take it to another place. And they are when they realize it's not edible, they just drop it. So then, of course, the seed can find another habitat and start germinating. So this is to deceive the animals or cheat the animals. They have either shapes or patterns. Again, if we look at examples, the castor oil. This one is castor oil, castor or castor oil. This is these are the castor seeds. So here you can see they also look like a certain type of insect. So because of that animal gets deceived and they get, they take them somewhere. And here also you have these hook like structures. Sometimes these seeds and fruits, they don't have just one adaptation. They have more than one adaptations. So here also they can get attached to the body as well. Otherwise they can be mistaken as an animal or a prey and be taken by an animal. Then we have the Olinda or Kundrumani. Then we have the Madhathiya seeds or the Manjadi that again has this red color structure again can be mistakenly or the animals can be cheated thinking these are insects. So there are again you can see the bright color to attract animals. Similar thing in bitter gold. Bitter gold also you can see the ripened one inside there are very bright red color or orange color seeds. So that again can be mistaken by the animal as a prey. So all these you can see mostly red color, bright red, bright orange in order to attract the animal. Then he also it's oil caster. So oil caster, then we have red bead that is this Madhatiya or Manjadi. Then we have Olinda or Kundrumani here and bitter goat there. So these are all fruits that are or seeds that are dispersed by animals where they have different shapes and patterns to treat animals. So I'm sure you all can understand all these adaptations. Now you all can relate these adaptations to other fruits and seeds as well. With that I will move on to the next one. So here we discuss the dispersal of fruits and seeds by wind. The second method of fruit and seed dispersal, dispersal by wind. So fruits and seeds dispersed by wind have following adaptations. So again to be dispersed by wind, they have certain adaptations. We discussed two fruits. Can you all remember two seeds? I told you all about cotton as well as drumsticks. In cotton, I told you all very tiny seeds, very light seeds and produced in a large number. Then drumstick, I showed you all there is a membrane like a wing like structure and that is also a light seed. So those are two adaptations you already know. Now we will look at these adaptations. First one, having structures like threads to float in air, structures like Threads. This also I told you all. The first one, milkweed, vara or erukale. Then there is cotton and there is imbul. So in all these, you can see here. In milkweed, can you see? Now normally when you look at the seed, you have the seed like that, a black color or dark brown color seed. Here you have hair-like structure. So this helps the seed to float in the wind. It just 
flows with the wind because the seed is very tiny it's very light and it has this hair like you can see this white color hair like structure it can easily flow with the wind and here also you can see a large number now inside this seed you can see inside this fruit you can see lot of seeds about thousands of seeds so they all just flow with the wind that is milkweed then look at the cotton one now here of course you can't actually see the cotton seeds when the cotton burst open you have the cotton wool inside that you get the tiny seed they also with the cotton they just flow with the wind so that is in cotton then again you can see in wool that also same thing now when this seed burst open inside you can see again something cotton like structure very light spongy like outer structure that helps the seed to spread the way with wind so having structures like threads to float in yeah thread or hair like structures then we have the next one the next adaptation possess wings wing like structures to float again wing like structures to float so here this is the first one it's horror seed here this part is the seed and these are the wing like structures anne so that is one example then you are here you can see gum malu that also the seed is in the middle outside you have the wing like structure similar thing goes for drumstick drumstick here we have the dry seeds but in the normal one like i showed you all if you look at it there's a wing like structure like a membrane thin structure outside in the middle is the seed so here of course you see only the seeds there these are all examples for seeds that possess wings hora or anne gamalu and drumsticks i am sure you all have seen all these seeds so you know their adaptations well with that i will move on to the next one fruits and seeds born at the apex of the plant why apex of the plant you all can remember when we discuss pollination by wind they are also the fruits and seeds are born at the apex of the plant why when the wind blows if it is at a high elevation normally there are less hindrances so it's easy for the fruits and seeds to float with the wind so fruits and seeds born at the apex of the plant again you can see mahogany and hora or anne now in this even in mahogany you can see the wing like structure now this part this is the seed this is the wing like structure so early also i told you all students these fruits and seeds they don't have just one adaptation they have many adaptations so although we take examples for one particular adaptation that means it's not the only adaptation so here you can see this also has a wing like structure here also there is wing like structure and they are all born at the apex of the plant that is at a higher level so higher elevation so that it's easy to flow with the wind then the next one this is also something i told you all seeds being very light now here of course you can see the orchid seeds inside the fruit inside the cover there are very tiny seeds very very tiny and very very light not only this one even the milkweed that also has very light seed if you take epilipid that also has very light seeds even cotton they all have very light seeds drumstick all of them even these they can easily flow with the wind so you all can imagine that seeds being very light then we have the next one production of fruits and seeds in large numbers this also i mentioned to you all early also i showed you all here you can see milkweed lot of seeds inside so examples grass now you take this part of the grass there will be so many seeds very tiny we talked about tuttiri or lab grass i told you all those very tiny seeds they can just get attached to your body your dress even your shoes but there will be a lot in within this small area there will be a lot 
then we have mahogany then we have milkweed vara or erikalai and also cotton within this there will be many cotton seeds very tiny round seeds here these are the tiny seeds of milkweed then this is mahogany so like that they are produced in very large number those are the adaptations of fruits and seeds to be dispersed by wind so we saw there are structures that can be used to float hair like structures or thread like structures then they have wing like structures they are after they are born at the apex and also the seeds are very light and they are produced in large number so those are the adaptations of fruits and seeds that are being dispersed by wind with that students i'll move on to the next one dispersal of fruits and seeds by water so again we discussed an example you all can remember coconut and you can remember the adaptations also having a husk which has air within it so that the seed becomes the fruit becomes light at the same time a hard shell so that water does not enter into the seed so those are a few adaptations we will look at the rest of the adaptations fruits and seeds dispersed by water possess following adaptations so the first one having porous or fibrous pericarps so when we say pericarp you all know the wall of the ovary becomes the pericarp in this picture if you look at the picture here what you see here is the pericarp i am sure you all all know a coconut you would have broken a coconut you would have observed all these so you know what pericarp is this is what we call as the husk in that only we get the coconut husk so here that is a fiber like structure with air within it so because of that the whole fruit becomes light so porous or fibrous pericarps this is one example then you can see the outer skin that is very very thick skin so that also doesn't allow water to go in because if the husk gets soaked with water again it will become heavy then it cannot float on water so to prevent that there is a very thick skin so here you can see the outer skin thick outer skin outer skin as i told you all students when you look at a fruit or a seed not only the adaptations given here try to understand more of their adaptations because these are all fruits and seeds familiar to you so coconut has a thick outer skin doesn't allow water to go in so that the this fibrous or porous part that does not get soaked so that it doesn't become heavy so this fibrous part what we call as husk helps the coconut to float on water so this is how it happens see of course already while floating it has started to germinate you can see the plantlet coming out so that is how germination takes place this is how you get the coconut on a tree you can see the other examples also this is ceylon almond then there is diyakaduru or kallithi that is sea mango so coconut ceylon almond and sea mango so they all have this porous or fibrous pericarps inside the ceylon almond also that's called kottamba there you could have seen the shell the strong or hard shell so you might have eaten this even this gets ripen you can eat the outer fleshy part also after that inside you will get the very strong shell like structure we sometimes kids they use a stone to hit it and break it so that you can eat the inside the edible part so that is ceylon almond then we have sea mango all with porous or fibrous pericarps then we will move on to the next adaptation possess pericarps that are suited for flotation pericarps you know what pericarp is the ovary wall becomes a pericarp so that usually uh, depending on the mode of dispersal the nature differs so here the pericarp is suitable for flotation so look at this fruit is it familiar to you all 
actually lotus, water lily, all of them have similar fruits. If you look at this one, lotus and here water lily, you can identify both of them, they look similar. Now this whole thing floats in water. Inside that you get the fruit or the seeds. So there what will happen is that particular pericarp is like a spongy like structure. So that can easily float and also it's like a disc like structure. You can see it has a circular shape, a disc like structure so easy to float. Similar thing or adaptation which usually go together having air filled shells. So one is they have the pericarp that is suited for flotation. We take lotus as an example having air filled shells. So that again here outside you can see what I told you all the disc like structure or the saucer like structure that is spongy or air filled. So that means they become light the whole thing can float and inside here you can see the fruits and inside the fruit there is the seed. So they get dispersed. Possess pericarp that are suited for flotation, lotus. Having air filled shells that is again water lily. So two examples, they both have the water as the habitat. So obvious water has to be the medium of fruit and seed dispersal and they show these adaptations. I am sure you all have seen them before as well. So with that students, I will move on to the next slide. The next mode of dispersal, dispersal of fruits and seeds by explosive mechanism. So here, pericarp of the fruit of some plants explodes and these seeds are dispersed far away. So how do they get dispersed? Now this pericarp actually can explode. I told you all about balsam or kudalu or what we call as kasitumbe that has a cover that is the pericarp I told you all the pericarp is something like this like a skin when it is mature enough dry enough if you just touch it it will burst open sometimes when it becomes dry itself because there is no water automatically it burst open so there are different methods by which this burst open or due to vibration also it can burst open so by different methods. So here it can be due to touch, due to touch or after dry. When it is very dry also it can burst open. So due to one of these reasons the pericarp will burst open and the seeds inside. I told you all there will be very tiny seeds inside here. So they will all get pushed away because there is an explosion, there is somewhat a force. So they just get spread away from the mother plant. So pericarp of the fruit of some plants explodes and these seeds are dispersed far away. And there are many examples. Now here you can see rubber. Now rubber is again by explosive mechanism. Here you can see these are the seeds inside that's the seed. Now this is the pericarp that burst open. The seed is pushed away, thrown away. So that is an example, rubber. Then we have mother tear. Now this is how initially the seed is there. Earlier we saw mother tear for dispersal of fruits by animals. The colors, they are they look like other animals or cheat animals. So there also you can see inside the fruit it's like a pod like structure. When the pod becomes very dry it actually burst open and all the seeds inside they come out. So that's mother tear or manjadi. Then we have lady's finger. Now even this fruit you all know when it becomes very dry if you touch and see the lady's finger you can feel that if you press hard it will break open, explode. But normally, naturally when the fruit is on the tree, when it reaches that stage where the seeds can be dispersed, it automatically explodes and you would have seen those very tiny whitish color or light greenish color seeds. They get dispersed. So that is again by explosion. Then we have the kudalu plant that is this. 
that's what I told you all as balsam. Another name for kudalu is balsam and in also known as kasi tumbai. So here you can see rubber, then we have lady's finger here, then we have kudalu here or balsam and then we have mother tear or manjadi there. So all these are seeds that are dispersed by explosive mechanism. So I am sure you all can understand all these different methods of seed and fruit dispersal as well as you can relate the method to their adaptations or vice versa you can relate the adaptation to the method. And also students you all can remember all these fruits and seeds they don't just have one adaptation at the same time they can be dispersed by more than one method. So, for example, if we take mother tear. Now, mother tear, the seeds are red in color. Why? They cheat the animals. So, they are dispersed by animals. Then they show explosive mechanism. So, that also get, helps to disperse the fruit and seeds. So, two methods of seed dispersal. The same way, they have different adaptations. Now, here you can see this one. If we take balsam. There is the adaptation for the pericarp to burst open. Then it can be spread by wind as well. Why very tiny seeds, very light and a large number of seeds. So that again dispersal by wind. So like that they can be dispersed by more than one method. And also for that they can show more than one adaptation. Earlier we saw mahogany. The light seeds, they have a wing-like structure, a large number of seeds are produced. So again, many adaptations to be dispersed by wind. Same goes for milkweed, very tiny seeds, hair-like structures, thread-like structures to float. Large number is produced. They also can burst open and the seeds can flow out. So like that, there are many adaptations. So, from all these adaptations in nature, the plants make sure that their seeds go to a new environment, they find a new habitat and also there will be less competition, they will be free from pests and diseases and also they become more strong, getting adapted to new environments. So, they satisfy all these requirements. And once they find the suitable place to grow, that process is known as germination. So the growth of a plant from a seed or a fruit, seed of a fruit is known as germination. So that is what we will be discussing after this. So then we will discuss germination of seeds. So what is germination? The growth of the plant from the seed. Inside the seed, there will be the embryo that will actually develop into the plant and thereafter the plant will start growing. So that process is what we call as germination of seeds. Activation of the embryo, so the embryo has to be activated in a seed and its development to form a seedling. So seedling is the initial plant, the young plant is what we call as seedling. So activation of the embryo in a seed and its development to form a seedling is known as seed germination. So now you all know the seeds get dispersed, fruits get dispersed, they find a new habitat and they need to have all the required conditions, then only they will start germinating. Following factors are essential for seed germination. So one factor is an internal factor that is known as viability of seeds. Viability. Now this is something you would have seen at home even maybe you would have done it. When you take a handful of green gram, mongata seeds and you put it into, soak it into water, you put the few green gram seeds you put water and when you allow it most of the seeds will sink in water they will go down 
but there will be a few dud seeds, what we call as dud seeds. They will be floating in water. What are those dud seeds? They are like empty seeds. So those seeds will not develop or germinate into a new plant. So that means the seed should have viability. It should have the ability to develop into a plant. So there should be an active embryo that can develop into a seedling. So that will germinate into a plant. So that is why we say viability of seeds. That is like an internal factor. It is part of the seed or the feature of the seed, essential factor that is present in the seed. The other factors are environmental or external factors. Then the seed needs air or oxygen for germination. Air, you all know, for respiration, they need oxygen. Initially, when the seed starts germinating, it doesn't immediately do photosynthesis. So it doesn't need carbon dioxide initially. Because in the seed itself, there is food storage. As I said again, now green grams, cowpea or any uh, even paddy. All these, we are able to consume them as grains. Why? Because there is fruit, food storage. Same thing goes for coconut. The endocarp of coconut, what we use for cooking. That is the food storage that will be used by the embryo inside for the germination or development into a seedling. So for that to happen, the food has to digest and also the embryo has to respire. The seedling has to respire. Only once the seed, the seedling forms or develops leaves, then the young plant will start photosynthesizing. So until then, it needs air or oxygen. Then they need moisture or water moisture or water again as i said water has to go into the seed the food storage has to be digested so the seed gets enough energy embryo gets enough energy to develop into a seedling so for that also they need moisture or water even if all these conditions are there, if the temperature is not optimal, then also the seed will not germinate. So they need an optimum temperature or we can just write the fact as temperature. So four factors, viability of seeds, air or oxygen, then there is moisture or water and temperature. Why temperature is important? If it's too cold also, the activity of the embryo will not take place properly. The enzymes won't act properly. So the development from the embryo to the seedling will not take place. The same way if it is too hot, very high temperature, then also it will not be very suitable for the germination. So you have to remember the four factors. Viability of the seed, air or oxygen water or moisture and temperature. So when all these conditions are satisfied, if all the factors are provided, now you all know when you want to grow seeds, you put them in the soil, they, are, they get the nutrition also, they have the surface, the substrate to grow on. In addition to that, you need to water the seeds. So you provide water or moisture, then there's oxygen in air and also there's soil air. In addition to that, there is environment temperature, then the viable seeds will develop into a seedling. That happens in two ways. One is known as hypogeal germination, the other one is known as epigeal germination. Now we will discuss those two methods. So this is again for your extra knowledge, but you need to have an understanding about these two methods of seed germination. So seed germination occurs mainly in two ways. One is known as hypogeal germination. The other one is known as epigeal germination. This is actually based on the cotyledons. You all know what cotyledons are. In the seeds, if they are monocot plants, there is one cotyledon. If they are dicot plants, there are two cotyledons. If the cotyledon remains under the soil during the germination process, 
we call it hypogeal germination. If it comes out of the soil during germination, we call it epigeal germination. So, we will see how that happens. So, here we need to consider the cotyledon. Now, here you can see this is familiar to you. Something similar to a coconut seed. Coconut fr fruit developing into a plant. So, this is usually actually seen in monocots, the hypogeal germination. Here, when the seed germinates, plumule emerges up from the soil. Now, this part is what we call as plumule that emerges up from the soil, but cotyledon does not emerge up from the soil. So, I told you, if the cotyledon remains under the soil, we call it hypogeal. So, here cotyledon does not emerge up from the soil. That's important. So, cotyledon is inside. You can see here the cotyledon is inside. It doesn't come up. You will understand this better when we discuss the next process as well. Cotyledon and the endosperm supply food for the seedling. Endosperm, the food storage inside the seed. And the cotyledon, both of them supply food for the seedling at its early stage. So, the seedling is, is this one. This is the seedling. The young plant that develops from the seed. So, for that it needs food, for that the cotyledon as well as the endosperm, endosperm provides the food. But cotyledon does not produce food by photosynthesis, that is very um, important. Cotyledon does not produce food by photosynthesis. Most of the monocotyledonous plants show hypogeal germination, so that is very important. Most of the monocotyledonous plants show hypogeal germination. Coconut and corn. Is that clear to you all? So, you have the seed here. Inside the seed there is the embryo and here you can see the cotyledon. From that the plumule, the one goes up, forms the shoot system. Then this side it forms the root system. So, there the cotyledons are below the soil. So, the cotyledon and the endosperm together, they provide food for the seedling and then the developed part, the young, very, very young plant, initially what comes out of the seed is what we call as seedling. So, they do not do photosynthesis. Cotyledon does not carry out photosynthesis. Once the leaves are formed, now here you can see this is a very young plant, very, very tiny young plant. Now, that has developed leaves. So, when these leaves start doing photosynthesis, by that time, the seed has disappeared. So, all the food storage, everything has been used up. You can see the seed and the fruit becoming smaller because the food storage, everything is being used up. Then, of course, the leaves will start photosynthesizing. Then, of course, the plant will get enough food for its development. That is the hypogeal development. So, usually in monocot plants. Now, we will move on to the next one, epigeal germination. Now, look at the germination process first. Now, this is a green gram seed. You would have grown that when you were smaller also. You know this very well. This is the green gram seed. Now, here you can see the plumule coming out. Usually, this is seen in dicot plants, even green gram is a dicot plant. Now, here you can see the root system growing, but this part goes up. Here this side is the root. Then you can see this whole seed with the cotyledons, they come above the soil. So, epigeal germination, the cotyledons come above the soil. Then you can see here the first two leaves are produced. So, until then, the food storage in the seed that supports the growth, that provides the food, the energy needed for the development of the embryo into a seed leaf. So, thereafter, the leaves are produced and then the plant will start photosynthesis. Epigeal germination. Here, when the seed germinates, plumule, so here also you can see plumule, 
emerges up from the soil. So, this part is the plumule emerges up from the soil. Moreover, cotyledons produce food by photosynthesis in addition to supply stored food for the seedling in its early stage. So, in both methods. So, here you can see the cotyledons produce food. That is important. They come out of the soil epigeal germination and also they are a supply stored food for the seedling in its early stage. Most dicotyledonous plants, this is important. Most dicotyledonous plants show epigeal germination. So, for example, bean, tamarind, even green grams, all those are epigeal germination. So, I am sure you all can understand the process now. So, up to here, there is no photosynthesis. Once the young leaves are formed, by that time you can see the cotyledons are being used up. They are also doing photosynthesis. But once the leaves start doing photosynthesis, then the cotyledons are not there. They usually fall off or sub. This is actually the test, but the cotyledons disappear. So that's how the germination takes place. So that is the epigeal germination usually seen in dicots. In monocots, it's hypogeal germination. In dicots, it is epigeal germination. So, up to now, students, we have discussed the factors necessary for germination. Viability of seed, then there is air or oxygen, water or moisture, and also environment temperature. So, I said when all these conditions are satisfied, the seeds start to germinate. That is, the embryo develops into the seed leaf. But even with all these environment conditions, sometimes the seeds do not germinate and that is known as dormancy. That is what we are going to discuss next. Dormancy of seeds. So when we say dormancy of seeds, sometimes seeds do not germinate though the essential factors for germination are fulfilled. Very important. So, the seeds, they do not germinate even though the essential factors for germination are fulfilled. So, there is optimum temperature, proper temperature, but there is water, there is oxygen and the seeds are viable, but still they do not germinate. This condition is known as dormancy. Now, this dormancy is sometimes useful. Now, if the environment conditions are not suitable, undesired conditions, then of course the seeds can be dormant without developing until this environment condition becomes suitable for germination. That is okay. But even when there is all suitable conditions, even though the essential factors are provided and if it does not germinate, then of course it becomes a problem. So, seed show dormancy as an adaptation for adverse environmental condition. This is what I explained to you all. Adverse environmental conditions. If the conditions are not suitable, the seed does not want to germinate. It wants to get over this adverse condition by remaining without germination. That is a good thing. But once the condition becomes suitable. When the essential factors are there, seeds have to germinate. But sometimes that does not happen. The reasons following factors affect the dormancy of seeds. So, there are two reasons that affect the dormancy of the seed. One thing, the embryo inside the seed is not mature enough to develop into a seed leaf. So, that is one reason the dormancy is prolonged. Another reason, the seed coat or the testa does not allow water to go into the seed. If that does not happen, as I told you all before, the enzymes have to act on the food storage. Then only the energy will be used up by the embryo to grow into a seed leaf. That is not possible if the testa or the seed coat does not allow water to penetrate. So, due to these two reasons, the dormancy will be prolonged. 
so then the seed will not germinate so following factors affect the dormancy of seed embryo not being matured that is one reason the second reason testa testa or seed coat does not allow water to enter the seed so these are two factors but if we want to cultivate seeds we might need to remove or break this dormancy and that is done in different ways we will move on to the next slide where we look at some methods that are used to break the dormancy and make the seed to develop various methods are practiced to remove the dormancy of seeds though so this is to remove the dormancy of seeds before germinating them some of them are mentioned below so if you store the seeds for some period of time storing seeds for some period of time what do we do there we allow the embryo if the embryo not, is not mature enough we give time for the embryo to develop so by storing it we, there is time for the embryo to get mature so that it can germinate so that is one way of removing the dormancy then there is another method where they burn the villi on the seed coat or testa now there is the villi burning the villi on the seed coat or testa you would have seen in the seed coat there is a small structure if that is burned then it will allow water to go in so burning the villi on the seed coat or testa for example teak seeds now here you can see teak seeds these are teak seeds they have a very strong seed coat so when the seed coat the villa is burned then they allow water to go in removing the seed coat now in orange these are the seeds you have seen the seed we even with your nails you can just peel off the seed coat from the orange seeds so by doing that in orange we can remove dormancy removing the seed coat then there is another one keeping the seeds in hot water for example lead tree or ipilipid lead tree the lead seeds lead tree now these are the seeds you put them soak them into hot in hot water and leave them like that for few days again you might have to uh, replace the hot water it should be somewhat hot so then of course dormancy will be removed keeping the seeds in hot water then gently cracking the seed coat nelli here you can see nelli or nelli kai seeds now this part is the seed you can remember you would have eaten nelli the fleshy succulent edible part after that inside the seed coat is very hard you can bite it with your and break it with your teeth but you your teeth have to be very strong so what we can do is we can just hit it with a small children do that kids do that they just hit it with a clean stone and inside there is the black color seed that is also edible you can eat that right the same thing we do here gently cracking the seed coat nelli or nelli kai seed so by doing these methods storing seeds for some period of time burning the villi on the seed coat or testa removing the seed coat keeping the seed in hot water or by gently cracking the seed coat we can remove the dormancy then of course the seed will germinate so that is the process of seed germination in the next slide i will discuss an activity with you so activity design a suitable activity to investigate the external factors for seed germination so when i discuss the factors there were four factors you all can remember that viability of the seed i told you all that's an internal factor because it is a factor related to the seed then the other three factors what are they air or oxygen 
then there's water or moisture and environment temperature. So they want you to design a suitable activity to investigate the external factors for seed germination. You all can come up with different methods. I will give you all a very simple few activities that you can use test for the requirement of these external factors for the germination of seed. So we will start with water or moisture that is going to be the first one water or moisture. Here of course students you all can do it in any order no problem water or moisture we will take that as the first factor. So in order to test the requirement of this one moisture what can you do? You have done this before also in your smaller grades you would have grown green gram seeds. How do you do that? You take a yogurt cup you put a little bit of soil into it or sometimes you would have even taken cotton wool. You put cotton wool into it and on that you put a few green gram seeds and you provide water. You soak it in water and you allow the green gram seeds to grow. So similar thing can be done here but we have to do it in a slightly more methodical manner. So what we need to do is initially we need to take some green gram seeds green gram seeds seeds and also soak the green gram seeds green gram seeds seeds in water for a day you need to soak it in water for a day. So you can take a glass, put the green gram seed into it and put a little bit of water so that all the seeds are covered with water. You can let it to stand for one day and then only we do the activity. So for all the activities, we need to do these first two steps. We will be using green gram seeds. It's easy to germinate, easy to get it in the household also. Then to test for the requirement of water or moisture what we can do is divide them divide the seeds into two halves and after that what can you do here students I am not writing it as a proper activity I am just giving you all an idea so when you are writing the activity, you might need to write the materials needed, then the procedure, then you need to write the observation and the conclusion. Here of course, it's just the outline as to what you need to do. So then what we do is in one, you take a container, maybe a petri dish, I'll say a petri dish or it can even be a yogurt cup. And if it's a yogurt cup or petri dish, of course, you can't make holes. Sometimes if it's a yogurt cup, you can make tiny holes so that the excess water can drain off. So like this, you will need two petri dishes. In that, you need to take cotton wool. Cotton wool. Wool. So since we are doing it as an activity, we will stick to cotton wool. Otherwise, you can also even take soil. But if you are taking soil, you have to make sure there is dry soil in one of the cups and in the other one, there is soil that has moisture. Sometimes, if there is a small amount of moisture also, then the seeds will start to germinate. To avoid that only, we use cotton wool so that it will be completely dry. So then what we do is in both we have the petri dish or the yogurt cup, we have cotton wool. Then we put the seeds. In both we have the seeds. Let's say this is setup A and this is setup B. For B only, 
only for B, only in B, only for B, we need to add what? So that is the next step. You prepare the setup like this. Everything is the same. You have the same container, same amount of cotton wool, the same seeds divided into two halves and they have been soaked in water before. So everything is the same. They are exposed to air, they are exposed to sunlight. The room temperature is the same. You are going to keep them side by side. So all the conditions are same. Only difference is only in one we add water. To B we add water. So in A there is no water. So in B there is moisture. In A there is no moisture. Then we can say prepare, prepare the setup. A and B and leave for few days. Make sure there is enough moisture in B. So if you feel you have to observe it. If you feel that it's becoming too dry, you need to water it. Not a lot of water, you just need to put a very small amount of water so that it's always kept moist. So in B there is always moisture, in, there, in A there is no moisture at all. So when you observe after few days, what will you see? So here we can say observation, what will be the observation? In A seeds do not germinate. You will see the seeds as it is. In B seeds have germinate. So from that what can we conclude? You all know that no students when we give water we provide all the required conditions when we give water to one setup that is setup B here the seeds will germinate but because there is no water or moisture for setup A the seeds will not germinate. So from that we can have a conclusion, we can conclude and say water or moisture is needed for seed germination. So that is what you do in this activity. A very simple one. Always you need to initially take some seeds. You have to soak it in water. After that you have to divide it into two halves. So that we do the two activities. To one activity, one setup. We don't provide water. The other activity we provide water. Rest of the factors are the same. So then you leave the setup for about 2-3 days until you see the germination. Sometimes it might be even 3 or 4 days but you can see the germination clearly. So the observation will be in A where there is no water there will be no germination. In B there will be germination of the seed. So because of that we can conclude and say water or moisture is needed for seed germination. I am sure you all can understand this activity. You can even modify it and do it in a different way. You can incorporate all the factors together. You can have different setups A, B, C, D like that and then you can observe them also. So this is for the first factor. 
then there is another factor. You can think of the factor temperature. So in the next slide, I will explain a simple activity to test the necessity of temperature, required temperature for germination of seed. So temperature, normally what is the temperature that is suitable for seed germination? The room temperature, environment temperature. So how can you design an activity? You can easily think of a method to test for temperature. So here again, what do you need to do? The first step, soak some green gram seeds. Soak some green gram seeds. Seeds in water. I told you all the same steps have to be repeated. Then you need to divide the seeds into two halves. So you have two sets of green gram seeds. Then you, what do you do? Again, the setup. Let's say I will label it as C and D here. We will take petri dishes. So petri dish. Both are petri dishes, the same size. Then to that, we take cotton wool. Then what do we do? Do we give water? Yes, we need to provide water to both set up here. Why? We need to provide all the conditions. So here we are not testing for water. So both of them get water. Let's say this is C and this is D. So they have water, they have the substrate cotton wool and already we have the soaked seeds. So we need to place the seeds. The seeds are here. Then they have enough air or oxygen. All the conditions are there. Except we need to control the temperature. What can we do there? So what we can do is What we can do is prepare, set up C and D. Then what we can do is we can place one setup in the refrigerator. Refrigerator why? The temperature is very low. So let's say C place it in the refrigerator. D keep it at room temperature. That is how we are going to provide the factor. C does not have the required temperature. Refrigerator is too cool, you know, enzyme activity is not, does not take place inside the fridge. Normally, without, to prevent food spoilage, we place it in the fridge. So, same thing here. But when you keep it at room temperature, obviously the room temperature is proper for the germination of seed. So, that is how we change the conditions. Then after that, what will happen? We can observe it. Observe after few days. And he also make sure they get enough moisture during this time. So then of course they have all the factors except for the difference in temperature. So after that when you observe after that you can observe observation will be what? In C, 
no germination in d there will be germination so that is what happens there in c there will be no seed germination in d there will be germination so from that what can we conclude? Conclusion. Conclusion we can say suitable temperature is a necessary factor for germination of C. So that is another activity. I am sure you all can understand that. So if I go back and explain the activity to you all, this is what we do. We have to always start with this process. You need to soak some seeds in water, then you divide it into half. So again, from the same set, you are getting two halves of the seed. So we have enough viable seeds. Then you make the setup. In all the factors except temperature are same. You have a medium, the cotton wool, then you provide water, moisture, the seeds are there and they have enough oxygen. Even inside the fridge, refrigerator, there's enough oxygen. So then we place one inside the fridge that is C is kept inside the refrigerator, D is kept at room temperature. So when you observe after few days, you can see in C there is no germination, whereas in D there will be germination. So from that you can conclude and say suitable temperature is necessary for the, it's a necessary factor for germination of C. So that is how we carry out the activity. Then the next factor, you can think of, there are three external factors. What's the next one? It is oxygen. So can you think of a method to test for the requirement of oxygen? I'm sure you all can come up with a method. So the next factor is oxygen. What can we do there? The same thing. The first two steps have to be repeated. Soak some green gram seeds. in water for a day, divide the seeds into three parts here. I will explain the procedure. So then the next step prepare the following setup. So here what we will do is, so we will need to have three conical flasks. or even three bottles of the same size, shape and everything and into one conical flask, into these three we are going to take the green gram seeds. So that's going to be the same thing and into one we take boiled water, boiled water you boil the water, once it cools down a little bit, you pour the water into it and then over that we put a, we take a layer of coconut oil. Now you know what happens there. When you boil water, what happens? Air or oxygen that is dissolved in water is removed from water. So once you boil water, the oxygen is removed, air is removed. And after that, you take the water in and you put a layer of coconut oil. 
air cannot dissolve in water. So that means to this setup. Now let's say I will label this as setup E. Setup E. Setup E does not have oxygen. The same way what we will do is we will take boiled water into this also. That is also boiled water. This is also boiled water. But here we don't put a layer of oil. We can do this in different methods. We can just leave it like this. We have taken boiled water but we don't put a layer of oil there. It is exposed to air. Then in the next one we take normal water. That is normal water. So there we have E. I'll label this as F. And this will be G. So we have three set up. One with boiled water. Over that we have coconut oil layer. Here we have boiled water but there is no coconut oil layer. Then we have the next one. There is normal water. So we leave the three set up for a few days. And after that we need to observe. So we can say leave for few days, days and observe. So what will happen there? When you leave it like that for few days, you can observe the growth. So they are except for oxygen. In all three setup, you have the viable seeds. Then you have water. There is temperature because it's going to be at room temperature. Only difference is in setup E there is no oxygen. What will happen to setup F? We did boil the water. Then air will escape the water but we have just kept it open like that. So again oxygen can dissolve in water. So in both F and G, G is anyway normal water. So there will be dissolved oxygen or air. So in both the setup F and G, the seeds will germinate. But in E, there will be no germination. So thereafter, if we observe, we can say observation. In E, no germination. F and G germination nation takes place. So from that, what can we conclude? Conclusion. Air or oxygen is needed for seed germination. So that is how we need to do this activity. If we go back and look at the activity, so for all the three factors you need to soak the green gram seeds in water, then you need to divide it either into two halves or into three parts. Then we prepare the setup. Here you can see in one we take boiled water, over that we put a layer of coconut oil. In the next one we have the boiled water but there of course we don't put a layer of oil. In the last one there is normal water. Then of course what happens here? We need to leave the three set up for a few days. They get all the rest of the factors. And finally, when you observe in E, there will be no germination. In the other two, there will be germination. So from that, you can conclude and say oxygen is needed for the germination of C. So from these three activities, students, we have actually shown that we need the three external factors. 
water or moisture, then temperature and also oxygen. But for oxygen, you can also try another method. You all know when there is combustion, the oxygen will be used up. So here you can have two set up. In one, you can burn a candle and you can close the stopper of the two containers. So in the container where you burn the candle, oxygen will be used up. In the second container with the bottle closed, lid closed, there will be oxygen because there will be no burned candle. Then you can see the germination. That is also another method. So like that, you can come up with other different methods. And also as I told you all, now I have labeled all the setups starting from A to E, uh, actually A to G. So like that, you can do all the activities together also. To one, you can provide all the conditions. Next one, you can cut out water. The third one in the refrigerator and the fourth one without oxygen. So like that also, you can do the activity and test for all the factors that are needed for the seed germination. So I'm sure you all can understand these activities clearly students. These are very simple activities. You can even try it at home. So with that, I have come to the end of this chapter. So we started off with the process of reproduction. Under that we discussed sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction. Under asexual reproduction, natural vegetative and artificial vegetative reproduction methods of plants. Then we discussed the sexual reproduction where we looked at the structure of flowers, then the method of pollination, fertilization. After that, in this chapter, I discussed the dispersal of fruits and seeds and how seeds germinate. And now finally, the factors essential for seed germination. In addition to that, we also discussed dormancy and how dormancy can be broken if it continues even when there is the essential factors. So with all these discussions, I'm sure you all are very, very thorough with the reproduction seen in plants. So in the next chapter, I will discuss the reproduction of man.